Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our exam for a webinar series for the 2021 ABOG oral exam starting next week. I'm your host for this evening, Rob Pegues. The session is for uh, Tuesday, October 26th. So we'll be doing case list review. Let me just set up here for a moment. I think we already have quite a number of candidates with hands raised. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, and we'll get uh, through this very quickly and get right to our case list. I think everybody's actually good on audio. And everybody's got the raise your hand thing down very well. We get to our case lists here, which are right there. Great. And let's see, since we had candidates already up, uh, let me hit Dr. Minx and then I think Dr. Harani. See if uh, Abby, Abby, can you hear us okay? Yes. Hi. Can hey, hi. Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Let's get right to your case list here for a moment. I'll go down and find you here. There we go. We got you here. Thanks. All right, we're ready to go. Uh, anything particular you'd like to look at it with us this evening? Uh, no, nope. whatever you feel like. Okay, let's see. We'll start. We'll start with OB, and we'll just kind of rotate our way around as we go through the hour. Let's see. So, since I have your OB case list, uh, is there anything you've been looking at recently that maybe we should pick, or should we just go to some something completely random here? Completely random. Okay, sounds good. Let's see. Um, Let's see here. Uh, can we do, I'm just landing on several random, uh, maybe obstetrical lacerations, uh, as long as we haven't sure. talked about that in the past week. Okay, let's see. Sure. Well, let's, pick, let's pick just case 37. So this is a uh, primogravid, actually 40 and a half weeks, with a delivery and a third degree laceration repair. Um, the examiners, I think, may very well ask you, because this really turned up in the practice bulletin on this, on the, uh, the anal sphincter injuries. Um, are you aware of any uh, interventions uh, that have been identified which actually might increase the risk of having a third or fourth degree laceration at delivery? Did you say increase the risk or decrease the risk? Yeah, uh, sorry, decrease the risk. Decrease, decrease the risk. Anything um, you can do to reduce the risk. Yes. Uh, they talk about doing um, like perineal uh, massage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Talk about doing um, like warm compresses to the perineum. Good. Um, that is all I can think of at this time. Okay. That's it. There are, I think there are two that had actually really had some solid evidence behind it. Warm compresses to the perineum, which um, we see done here and there. Um, <clears throat> pushing in a lateral uh, maternal lateral position, I was mentioned also. Uh, okay. Perineal massage, uh, you know, elusive lubricant, stuff like that as well, good. So mm -hmm. in this case, were you, um, you, how did you identify that this was a third degree laceration? I think what the examiners are interested in is if you see a laceration that you are concerned is approaching the sphincter or the anal area, um, can you walk us through, how do you examine this to determine exactly what type and extent of a laceration it is? Sure, so, um, well, first I wanna make sure that my exposure to the area um, is adequate and that I have good lighting. Um, good. But basically, uh, uh, and also, you know, adequate anesthesia. But yeah. for the examination portion, um, I'm really looking to see um, the extent of the, um, of the uh, external anal sphincter. Um, so I'll usually grasp, um, the the external anal sphincter with like an alice clamp uh for example and then um i'll kind of evaluate to see uh if the uh if the external anal sphincter is compromised um i'll also do a uh a rectal exam to see if i can feel any um um like tears within the um within the um uh, rectal mucosa which would indicate a fourth degree so that's kind of how i would differentiate between the third and the fourth degree and then kind of differentiating between the types of different third degrees um, basically i would again grasp the external anal sphincter and kind of follow that along and see if the uh if it appears that the anal um the internal anal sphincter is compromised so tell me, you said about different types of third degree laceration tell me about that you you're checking out the external anal sphincter and you're looking at the internal anal sphincter also yeah, so there's a there's a categorization of yeah. 3A, 3B, and 3C. 
Um, so like a 3A, for example, would involve less than, I believe, less than 50% of the um, external anal sphincter. Okay. And then the 3B would include um, um, greater than 50%. And then the 3C uh -huh. would include the external and internal okay. anal sphincter. Good, great. So no if on your exam, that sounds actually that nicely done. Uh, if on your examination, your, it appears that the capsule of the external anal sphincter has been compromised, but it's not clear that the sphincter itself has been injured, uh, how would you classify that, that type of laceration? Um, I think I would still classify that as like a 3A. Got X, absolutely yes. Capsule, mm -hmm. capsule. As, as long as it, if I don't the capsule, that's 3A. Good. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, can you just tell us briefly about your repair of a third degree laceration? Sort of what suture do you use? How do you actually approximate layers? What points of caution do you observe? Yeah, so um, like for in this particular case, it was a 3A. Uh -huh. So Good. I typically use um, like a, a 2 O Vicryl uh, to reapproximate the um, um, to reapproximate the external anal sphincter, and I usually do it. Um, in a, um, uh, like a running method. I believe okay. there's two, two different methods, but the one that I yeah. use is just like interrupted sutures. Um, okay. And then, um, so I'm putting the, the sphincter back together and then um, I'm kind of reestablishing the, um, like a second degree laceration. Mm -hmm. For example, and then I would bring back the um, um, the um, like the bulbo spongiosis and the levator mm -hmm. uh type muscles. Good. Um, usually, usually I do that in a in a running um, in a running fashion, mm -hmm. and then I reapproximate. Um, then I reapproximate the. Um, the uh, skin mm -hmm. uh, in a in a subcutular fashion. Great. Uh, and then anything else that you do? Then at the end, I'll always uh, repeat a um, uh, a rectal examination to make sure that um, that I've closed all of the layers, and I wasn't, for example, missing like a fourth degree layer. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, is there anything else that your rectal rectal examination uh, evaluates for? Um, mm, I so that's the main thing I'm looking for is just okay, complete sure. closure. Uh, that is important. We want to be sure that we didn't miss an inadvertent fourth degree laceration. Um, mm -hmm. is there, as far as the repair that we just did, though, is there any information that we could otherwise get from doing a rectal exam that would help us to assess our repair? Um, I think making sure that you have like tension, um, tension off of that area because it's a high pressure area. But I'm, I'm just guessing. Okay, no, let's let's not guess in the exam. That's okay. If you're, if you're, a, a good thing to say would be, I'm not, I'm sure, not sure what you're trying to get me to say. Could we come back to it in a minute? So mm -hmm. let's let's actually do that. Um, okay. So um, in in a, in a subsequent pregnancy, um, in what, under what circumstances might you suggest that this patient maybe should not deliver vaginally again, but should actually consider delivery by cesarean? Are there certain uh, findings here? Uh, or uh, issues to consider for which maybe um, a repeat vaginal delivery patient is a patient at, at unacceptably high risk of uh, a worse injury, which could lead to a uh, uh, mm -hmm. more permanent anal sphincter injury? Uh, well, I think definitely if the patient develops uh, some sort of like rectovaginal fistula or mm -hmm. uh, develops some sort of like fecal incontinence, I would mm -hmm. definitely, you know, recommend a C-section over a trial of labor. But um, in general, um, my understanding is that we can also offer an elective um, okay. just from this history. Okay, so uh, so developing a fistula complications and a developing of a stool incontinence. Any other indications that you're aware of for where it's, it's recommended that we 
would consider a uh, cesarean in the next pregnancy? Um, um, if there was, maybe if there was, uh, she had any kind of poor wound healing, if she developed yes. like a subsequent infection. Good, yes. Any or that sort. Yes, any wound breakdown, wound healing complications, wound infection, uh, particularly anything that would require a revision or a re-repair, that's actually very important. Um, there's one more in there that uh, circumstances under which we could consider a cesarean delivery in the next pregnancy. Uh, if we were concerned about macrosomia. Hmm, okay, I'm, I don't think that one actually came up, although I mean, that could be a consideration. But um, I wouldn't say that in the exam because I really not, don't know. <laughs> No, there are, there is it specifically noted that if the patient herself has considerable anxiety or fear of oh. uh, the rest of consequence, that we could actually, that would be an elective repeat cesarean, but it is appropriate to offer a cesarean. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, coming back to the rectal exam, um, can we go back to any other, given the, the repair that you just described to me, is there any information that might be important to get from doing a rectal exam at the conclusion of your repair? Mm-hmm. I am still drawing a blank on that. Okay. I'm not well, sure. You repair the external anal sphincter. Uh, and one of the useful things about an exam is you can assess that you have sort of reasonable sphincter tone, that it feels like you actually got the tissues together, that something hasn't separated, um, that mm -hmm. the, the sphincter appears to be intact. That's that's one of the useful things that you can assess. Okay. Particularly because you've assessed that. Uh, and and your, your discussion of the repair, actually really, really like that was actually very nicely done. I would be sure in the exam, because it, it was really stressed in this practice bulletin. When you're talking about the sphincter repair, I would try to get the word overlapping in there. We used to talk about doing an end-to-end -end sort of interrupted sutures. And they really oh, that's what I was trying we, to. We get okay. Supply. I would use the word overlapping whenever you can if they're talking about these types okay. of lacerations with the sphincter. Okay. And I think that'll, that'll just put you in, in really good shape. Okay. Good, I mean, thank you for doing that. That was actually really, really well done and worth going through. Thank you for going through all thank that with you. us. Let's move on to start to see if Dr. Harani would join us here for a moment. Let me go see if I can find Sean for just a minute. There he is. Hey, Dr. Harani, can you hey, talk okay. okay. uh, Gynecology, uh, patient number Hello? nine. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, I can. can yes, I can. Um, yep. Gynecology list, patient oh, sure, number nine. Yes, thank you. Let me just get out here. I will cruise over. Hang on just a second. This is being uh, kind of slow this evening. Thank you. Just a moment and I'll get you a case list here. There we go. Let's see, we were down here, I think. There we go. Thanks. GYN case number nine coming up. Got it. Got it. Okay, I'm going to try that again. Um, it looks like we might not actually have. Uh, seeing, uh, let me just. I see we've got we've got icons for your OB and GYN, and this is a blank here for the GYN. It looks like we might actually not have GYN. Do you have your case list? Could you just maybe just sort of read us the case for a minute, and we'll just work with that? Yeah, because this is a that. question. So um, the patient, 71 year old, G2P2, uh, under diagnosis, preoperative. It's a recurrent postmenopausal bleeding. Good. History okay. of breast cancer on tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. Transvaginal ultrasound endometrial thickness, 2.4 millimeters, mm -hmm. endometrial biopsy, benign endometrial polyp. The okay. treatment was hysteroscopy DNC, and then the pathology was just benign fibrogranular endometrial polyp, no complications. Great. Uh, did you have a particular question about that? Yeah. If, you know, um, if they go to the extremes with this, where they say, okay, um, after the polyp, she still has more bleeding. My concern oh. was how far they can take this. Um, you know, if somebody comes in, um, initially I did the ultrasound 2.4, I wasn't as concerned. Then she bled again, I did the EMB, she had the polyp, obviously it was uh, uh, reasonable to do the hysterectomy DNC polypectomy. If she bleeds again, um, though, what's the uh, most um, conservative, uh, but, but you know, patient-centered way of approaching this, still to have recurrent bleeding afterwards. Are they going to see if I'll do a TLH sooner or later? How will I approach the sir? Is that, is that, would you be leaning towards something like a hysterectomy? No, no. I mean, if she oh, came back I in, that, yeah, you know, right. if she was uh, 
leading then I would say, okay, I would uh, you know do another transvaginal yeah. ultrasound for endometrial yeah. thickness. Um, yeah. And if, she, if they go, okay, she's still bleeding, that's okay, then I'll do another DNC. It, it, do you ever notice, uh, will they try to get you to see how aggressive you'll be uh, if someone has recurrent postmenopausal bleeding? Sure, I, I think that's a good place to go. Let's. So in this case, uh, just very briefly, you got an ultrasound, you, you mentioned this 2.4 millimeter endometrial thickness. Um, is there anything else, that, any other information that it's important for us to have from that ultrasound aside from the actual endometrial thickness assessment? No, I mean, it, in, in, that was the first time she had uh, had post sure. but but the, the important thing is there are certain criteria, that, and endometrial thickness is part of it. Is there anything else that we need to know from the ultrasound aside from that the endometrium is two point four millimeters? In um, order in order to be able to say, okay, we can just watch this. We don't have to do a biopsy. I mean, in general, the idea of if it's less than five millimeters, we can monitor. Um, but other than that. More. Four or four millimeters or less. There are actually three yeah. things, and we should be sure that we to get these out. Think first, uh, endometrium, four millimeters or less. Uh, second one is it should be homogeneous. It should not have heterogeneous or regular irregular features, because that suggests maybe a structural lesion such as polyp. The third thing is that it, the entire endometrial cavity should be visualized. So we actually have to have all three of those before we can actually set this aside and say, let's just watch and see if something else comes up. So and one of the issues that comes up in these menopausal women is maybe she has sort of a, a larger fundal myoma and it obscures part of the endometrial cavity. So if the examiners ask you about this, you, you do have to say, if, if it's only a partial visualization of the cavity, I can't use that, you know, to say that, you know, by the, the by the, um, yeah, the negative predictive value, she's probably okay. Um, I, I would have to go further. So if the thickness were more than four millimeters or it were not homogeneous, or we did not have the entire cavity assessed, we can't rely on our ultrasound and we would have to go to histologic examination like sampling or DNC. So I think it's really important to get those three things out to the examiners right away. Now to your question, you went in and you did a hysteroscopy, which is really the gold standard for looking around and make sure everything looks all right. You took your polyp off, you did some sampling. I'm assuming you saw no other issues with in the endometrial cavity. Um, and so, but, so they could ask you, um, what other issues in the endometrial cavity might you come across for which she might actually have continued bleeding after you take this polyp out? Hmm. I mean, what other things in a, in, a, in a menopausal woman um, could, what other things aside from the polyp could cause her maybe to keep bleeding? I mean, yeah, especially someone that was a history of tamoxifen, hyperplasia, um, uh, sure. Good. Now that's true. You might be, and you pick that up on your histology, I would hope also. Yes, that's true. So she could have a coexisting hyperplasia. That's true. Um, anything uh, else that might be sort of maybe a little bit more common? Besides the polyp. Um, yeah. That's something you, you probably would notice when you did your hysteroscopy, so you could report it out to the examiners. Huh. Uh, for instance, if she had a, a submucous myoma or partially intracavitary myoma, now you can't really, you'd have to reset up and do an operative hysteroscopy to take care of that. But if you notice that during your exam, that's something that could cause her to have continued bleeding because the presence of the myoma is probably going to destabilize the endometrium, which is already thin and atrophic anyway. Those people tend to have recurring bleeding issues also. So if you had noticed something like a submucous myoma, that might be a reason why she could keep bleeding. An undiagnosed okay. hyperplasia or malignancy is another reason that she might keep bleeding, although <clears throat> that would lead them to ask you sort of what's the sensitivity of your, your sampling on DNC. And it's, you know, hysteroscopy DNC is pretty high. Um, so suppose uh, you saw nothing else. I just took out the polyp, the in inside of the cavity, otherwise it was just pristine. Uh, and let's say uh, four months later, she came back because she's spotting again. What, how would you evaluate that? Um, in this case, I would um, go back to doing uh, the transvaginal ultrasound for the three carriers uh, to make sure it's uh, four or less millimeters, homogeneous uterus, and I can still evaluate the entire cavity. Okay. Um, is, there, is there anything you do before you go to the ultrasound? Hmm. How, how old was this woman? 71, sir. So, okay, so that's a very pertinent question here. Um, is there anything, anything otherwise that might be causing her bleeding or spotting? It was actually spotting, I think. Right, right. Um, so no matter, we'd want to do something very basic, just like history and exam, I think, before we go to the ultrasound. And is right. there anything else you might be looking for on the exam that might 
maybe be another explanation why she's having this spotting of the bleeding. Um, maybe we could have also an atrophy. Yes, exactly. You do an exam and, and check out the vaginal mucosa, the cervix. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this could be atrophic vaginitis with bleeding. Before you go to an ultrasound, I think you'd just want to do that. So basic exam, um, any other signs or features. Now, would you really go back and get an ultrasound here? Because only four months ago, you were in there. You actually looked around with the scope. You took out a polyp. You sampled the endometrium. Um, is something new and dangerous going to turn up for her over four months' time for which we have to go back and reassess this? Uh, less likely. No, yeah. not no, no, no. Seriously, not. I mean, it's, you, you know, hyperplasia would not suddenly develop out of nowhere after four months, and you probably sampled a cavity well. A polyp wouldn't regrow over that period of time. You would have noticed anything else in there, so you could do an examination, and for a period of time, you could continue to observe this. If she had a persistent recurrent bleeding, you'd probably have to go back and do your assessment all over again. Okay. Um, but but it's it that's a question that's less likely to come up um, because just it's it's not very common. Uh, the idea is you went in and and you assessed everything that you needed to assess. They could ask you, for instance, how likely is it that you could miss an endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma with your DNC? In other words, how accurate is your DNC in actually assessing the entire cavity? Oh, um, I think uh, greater than ninety percent. Uh, I don't know the exact percentage of how accurate it is. It, it would be nice if it were. I don't think it's quite that high. And I think it depends a lot on the sort of, you know, uh, whether you can adequately visualize and sample the cavity in a 73-year-old. That's sometimes difficult. Um, and, you know, your pathologist and other things like that. They used to say that endometrial biopsy and DNC were both about 60 to 65 percent sensitive. I think they are more than that these days. I think if you said 80 percent or above, you'd be relatively safe. And that's a rough ballpark figure, although I don't know that there's an actual ballpark figure. Uh, but there is the possibility that we might have missed something. And and if you had persistent bleeding over a period of months, you might go back and reassess. But I think you'd have to do that with sampling, you know, with endometrial biopsy or, or histology, because you had, you know, a normal ultrasound the first time, and then you ended up going in, you know, and taking out a polyp. Um, so, so see, I think I think if that question comes up, the issues are what else could cause the bleeding, and always think about the lower genital tract as well as the upper genital tract. It might be something very simple um, and fixable. Um, think about how long it's been since you did the procedure. Is it likely that anything, you know, have I missed anything? Uh, and if so, sort of go for what you're missing. But I think if you're going back and checking again, you're moving more toward a histologic exam than repeating the ultrasound. Gotcha. Because really, the ultrasound is sort of the first time she bleeds. And if that's reassuring, you can watch her. But the rule is any recurrent bleeding needs to be sampled. And what you have now is you did a bunch of procedures on her, and now she has recurrent bleeding. And I think recurrent bleeding means sampling, probably not doing the ultrasound again. Okay. Gotcha. Does that make, that make sense? I think Absolutely. that would be the way to go. Good, good work. Thank you. That was actually, that was very worthwhile doing, especially because we just, those ultrasound endometrial thickness assessments are really useful and important, but we do have to remember just all the components of what we have to report out to the examiner. That was great. Let's get to Dr. Tran for just a moment. Uh, Linda, I'm trying to get you unmuted. If you can unmute yourself. Oh, I think we got you. Hi, hey, Linda, can you hear us? I can. Oh, good. Thanks for joining us. Let me just go and find your, there we are. These are sort of semi-alphabetized. There we go. All right, I'm all set. What would you like to look at this evening? Whatever you want. Okay, let's see. Can we do office since we've hit OB and GYN so far? Okay. Oh, we'll do that. Okay. And if you, is there anything on office that you'd like to look at? Uh, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll just pull something at random here. Whatever you want. Sounds good. Let's see. Great. Can we do case number seven? It's a 27 year old with a positive pregnancy test. Let's just take that and go from there. Um, so a 27-year-old got a two pair of zero comes in and she reports a positive pregnancy test three days ago. Uh, tell me what your initial evaluation given only this information would consist of, if you could. So I would start with a thorough history and physical, asking her um, certainly her pregnancy history, but also her LMP, um, if she has regular periods. Uh, and then just the standard, you know, what medical problems she has, what surgeries she's had, what medication she's on. Oh. And then I go on to do my um, my exam. Um, so doing a um, just a head to toe and then focusing on the pelvis, uh, collecting a pap smear if that's uh, if it's not up to date. Oh. And then I move on to um, 
to just confirm the pregnancy. So with the with a pregnancy test followed by a, um, a pelvic ultrasound. Ah, oh, good, great. Um, would you go right to a pelvic ultrasound, or is there other testing you might get first? If you're gonna go with the ultrasound, that's fine. Um, that's what I typically do if her pregnancy test is positive. Sounds good. Then sounds good. Yeah. good. That's fine. That sounds good. Uh, well, if her menstrual period was four weeks ago and her pregnancy test was positive three days ago, would you go to the ultrasound now? Oh, I see. Right. Then, um, if she tells me that she has a reliable menses, I mean, like her, like her periods are regular and, yeah. um, and such, then it is very unlikely that I'll see anything on ultrasound. Yeah. So, um, I, um, I might consider a, for example, a quant, uh, I would, I would order an, a quant at that point. Good. That sounds good. Is, Great. Good. Yes. Um, if your HCG quantitative is turned at uh, 5,000, uh, what would you do with that information? If it was 5,000, I would definitely proceed with an ultrasound. Good. Okay. Because I would expect to see a pregnancy. Okay. Uh, if your ultrasound shows a early, sort of very small, possibly intrauterine sac, um, and like a two centimeter um, you know, ovarian cyst, right ovarian cyst, um, how would you interpret that information? So it, um, so right now it could be a intrauterine pregnancy. It could be a ectopic. Mm -hmm. um, I would need further information either with a, um, with like zero quants, or mm -hmm. I could repeat this. So assuming what I'm seeing is what is suspicious as a gestational sac that's less than 25 millimeters. Um, right. Mm -hmm mean sac diameter, then um, then I would repeat it in two weeks. In two weeks, got it. Okay, so which way would you go? Serial titers or repeat the ultrasound in two weeks? It depends on um, if she's symptomatic, uh, what yeah. the titers are. Mm -hmm. um, if okay. she is symptomatic, then I would do, I would repeat the, the quant in 48 hours. Yeah. Um, when you say symptomatic, what are you considering here? With either bleeding or... Um, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Good. Or okay. pain. Okay, yeah, if, she, if she has neither of those, where, which way would you go first? If she has neither of those and her um, quant isn't above, let's say, 3,000. Yes, say, well, it was 5,000 to start, so let's, let's go with that. If it was 5,000. Yeah, and the ultrasound was just small possible sac and a two centimeter right uh, ovarian cyst. Just to be on the side of caution, I would. Mm -hmm. I would repeat it in 48 hours. Repeat uh, the titer? The, a quant, a quant, yes. A quant, sure, titer, okay, good. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see, if in 48 hours it's uh, 6,000, uh, what would you do next? So 6,000, so from 5,000 to 6,000, that is concerning yeah. that this is an abnormal rise. Hmm. Um, from, right, from 5,000 to 6,000? Okay. Is that yeah yeah because i would ex um so i would expect at least 33 percent rise yeah, i guess probably. i would have to do that math but yeah but, right it's less than, 30. um, that less than 33. yeah okay then um then i would so my concern would be that this might be a ectopic okay um or or or, or an abnormal pregnancy Mm -hmm. um, well, meaning that this topic, would be topic like a, I mean, I, I mean, like a, yes, an abnormal an ectopic is an abnormal pregnancy, but like yeah. a, a that this is a is going to be a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Ah, got there it goes. So it could be a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy, right. or it could be an ectopic. Got it. Good. So how would you discriminate between those two? What would your ongoing? So be? if I do a. Um, for example, a DNC or like an aspiration of the uterine contents and um, it comes back as villi, then um, this is a this is a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Got it. Okay. Would you go to a uh, DNC or uterine aspiration at this point? At this point, I think I still want to err on the side of caution. 
I mean, if I follow another 48 hours, it would be unlikely that she would rupture. So I would, I would um, advise her, uh, like give her precautions of like an ectopic, like if she, yeah. she, if she were to have any pain or bleeding, then to come in right away. But it, I think it would be reasonable to get another 48 hour quant and okay. see if, tra can, you know. Yeah. Good, and I think that's right in, line, right in line with the committee opinion uh, on this. It really, the idea was to reduce the incidence of sort of unintended operation upon something that might eventually be a viable pregnancy. If she's asymptomatic, I think it's absolutely safe to check some more titers and see where it goes. Good. Uh, so if in 48 hours it's uh, gone from six to 8,000, what would you do at this point? Oh boy. Um, so that, I mean, that's, Still an abnormal rise. Mm -hmm. I would counsel her that. Um, I mean, with eight thousand, I certainly would. Sus mm, I think at this point, I would tell her that this is most likely a failed pregnancy, and so then I would um, counsel her that you know her option, her options would be. Um, to like expected management versus medical versus surgical. Okay. Uh, which would you lean toward at this point? I would lean towards expectant. Okay, good. So if you're going to watch this, what would you then do next and when would you do it? Um, so if I am convinced that this is a failed intrauterine pregnancy and she yeah. desires to do expected management, I would tell her that, um, um, it could take up to six, I mean, sorry, eight weeks for the uterine contents to spontaneously pass. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I could tell her to follow up with me in maybe one to two months and, and see if, um, if she's expelled. Hmm. Okay. Is there anything else you might, you might check in the meantime or anything you might want to do? I mean, I could check a progesterone level. Oh, uh -huh. so I, I would check her blood type. Oh, sure. Um, That's a good, to, that's a like, very good thing to check. Yeah. To make good. sure that to good. see if she needs, um, Rogam, for example. Good. So you're going to hang out with her for a couple months. I might to assume from that that you've made the determination that this is not an ectopic pregnancy, that this is in fact a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Hmm, that is a good point. Um, yeah. Right. Um, so then I. Yeah. Okay. See in the exam, in the exam, they won't give you that information. They'll let you just go. They'll let right, you go two right. months, and then she'll be in the emergency room with uh, her, right, rupture, with her, rupture, her right. the, the ruptured right. corneal or ectopic pregnancy is bleeding out. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 So in that case, then I would advise either um, so methotrexate with aspiration. Um, okay. Just or or aspiration first, and then methotrexate. Mm -hmm. um, is what I would advise her. Okay, sounds good. Would there be any role to recheck in an ultrasound before we do this? Would that give you any additional information that would be valuable to you? It could actually, um, if like, for example, a heartbeat has developed in the yeah. meantime, then, yes. um, then my methotrexate would be less effective. True, and if the heartbeat were in the endometrial cavity, you might not want to be doing your, your interventions. That's true. Right, right, right. Yeah, it might. It might. Yeah, I, mean, I think I. I suspect you would really want to know whether this is intrauterine or extra uterine right. and what else is going on. Uh, and if your title went from five thousand to eight thousand, it wouldn't be unreasonable to check an ultrasound again. Okay. And in the exam, I think I probably I would allow that. Good. Um, because if, if I think if you do that, the examiner would then say something. So now your ultrasound identifies um, that the, the endometrium appears normal and this right adnexal cyst is unchanged. Um, the sac that we saw before is actually outside the endometrial stripe. It's in the upper right aspect of the uterus. What would be your possible diagnosis now? Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite get that. 
Oh, sorry. So your end, your endometrium is normal, and the right adnexal mass hasn't changed. And that sac that we we're looking uh -huh. for is actually outside the endometrial cavity in the upper right aspect of the uterus. Uh, upper right side of the uterus. So this, yeah. so it's outside of the uterus. It's outside the endometrial cavity. It's in the upper right aspect of the upper fundal upper right aspect of the uterus. But you can see oh, a separate so endometrial stripe. So like a corneal ectopic? It's a, cor it's a corneal pregnancy, yes. Yeah. Yes. So how would you, so that would be, now this would be the last question because they really would have to move on. How would you manage a, a finding of an early corneal ectopic pregnancy? I don't remember if a corneal has to be a surgical, but certainly a corneal ectopic could grow larger than a typical ectopic. Mm -hmm. So I would want to know more information about what's this um what the corneal ectopic looks like does it does it have a heartbeat what's its size no. nope. it's can, a sac can, it's a sac some debris inside of it some debris so then it sounds if it's you know if it's less than four centimeters it sounds like she's um she she qualifies for methotrex or Fine. oh no i can i can surgically remove this so i so hmm this is um I'm actually, so it sounds like I have to resect. I'm, I'm debating right now between if I, if I can give her methotrexate or if I can, if I have to resect this. Okay. What, what would, what would uh, make up your mind to this? What factors are you considering in determining medical versus surgical management? So the same thing um, I would consider for like if it if this was a normal tubule, so what her quant is, what Good. um like what the size, which you, you told me it's is not more than four centimeters if there is a fetus with a uh with a heartbeat. So mm -hmm. it sounds like right now she is a candidate for methotrexate. That that is fine. You could go either way you want to. I think conservative management if she's asymptomatic. And, and the other important thing to mention is that she is in agreement with the plan. She has no contraindications to methotrexate, and she is going to be reliable to follow up because close surveillance is the key to managing these things medically, obviously. Right. And I think if she, if you, you would want to mention those three things, um, and I think if you did that, you they would let you go with medical management. Yeah. It is it is fairly possibly you know preferable than having to do a coronal resection if it would be. Safe. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All righty. So that just, I mean, I just wanted, I thought we'd do this just because this is a common experience in the office exam. If you, all you have for that case is it says positive pregnancy test, and then there's all kinds of really interesting stuff to the right, but they will usually just start with that problem and just start from there. And then it will just be a blank slate and they can just write anything that they want to on it. Um, so that's so just in, in view of sort of how to think about studying for the exam, looking at sort of how you worked up your patient and all the good stuff you did here across to the right is good, but also just stop to think about sort of what could they ask me if all they looked at was my problem in those three words, where could they take it? And you know, start to think about ectopic pregnancies, pregnancy of undetermined location, you know, just how you would work that up and what questions they could ask. And that's an excellent way to study for the office exam. Good work, lady, you still there? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Cool. Good. Thank you. Any questions or anything you'd like to do before we move on to another candidate? No, that was good. Thank you. That was good. Thank you for doing that. That was excellent. That was very good discussion so far. Let me go back to uh, our list here. And just a second. Ah, there we go. Good. Let's see. I was hoping to get, uh, let's see. Bethany, maybe Amanda would be great. Let's start with Bethany for a minute. Uh, Dr. Dykes, trying to get you on. Muted here. Oops. Bethany just disappeared there. The raise your hand thing disappeared. We'll go up to Amanda. I'll come back to Bethany. Uh, Dr. Guardado, let's see if I can get you unmuted here for a minute. Uh, Amanda, uh, can you unmute yourself for a moment? Oh, yes. Hi. How are you? Hey, thanks. Sir. Good. Thanks. Let me just get to your case. That's what I did see down here. I'm going to read through one. So just a second. Ah, there we go. Thanks. Anything at all that you'd like to look at this evening? I think it's. Um, uh, maybe some office? office? Office is fine. Sure. Anything particular that you're looking at on office, which has been interesting to you this week? Um, no, anything that you want to do. Okay. Let's see. Let's go move beyond some of the stuff we've talked about so far. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, can we do, uh, actually this one, case number 15. 
37 week interviewed in pregnancy vulva recurrent vulvar sores um, just starting with that information at your 37 week OB visit um, and I'm assuming this is recurrent means it's been going on for a while um, but maybe this is your first opportunity to evaluate it what sort of things could be going on that would cause this complaint at full term pregnancy right so um, when this patient presented she complained of um, sores on her vulva that she had experienced before in the past. Um, so at that point, prior to doing any sort of further evaluation, my differential immediately was, of course, um, uh, herpes. Um, <clears throat> other things that it could be would be potentially um, maybe like a contact dermatitis, um, another sexually transmitted infection such as um, um, syphilis. It could be um, uh, a dermatosis of her vulva. It could be excoriation, some scratching. Um, um, sort of those, and then it could also be um, like a vaginitis, like um, like a, a vulval vaginitis, and she was just so sort of tender um, from that and just irritated from that as well. Um, I would start with that. Sounds good. Um, so based on that differential diagnosis, how would you work this up in the office then? Right. So first, I would start with a detailed history of physical exam. I'd want to know. Um, when this has happened before, sort of the um, the situation in which it happened, any interventions that were uh, that she tried, any other associated symptoms. Um, uh, does she um, is she sexually active? Does her partner have this experience? Has she ever received a diagnosis before, et cetera? Um, and then, uh, and otherwise, I would obtain a detailed medical, surgical, obstetric history if I wasn't familiar with the patient. At that point, I would move on to my um, genital urinary exam. So I first start with um, an external evaluation, evaluate her vulva. Um, <clears throat> if concerning for herpes, for example, I would do a PCR a swab of the lesion. Um, if my differential were pointing towards a different diagnosis such as um, vulval vaginitis uh, or like candida, I might do, a, a, I might do um, a culture for that. I would also move on to a speculum exam, look for any uh, vaginal lesions, any cervical lesions. Um, any abnormal discharge, bleeding, et cetera, anything that can sort of um, point to what this diagnosis was. Hmm. Okay. Um, so it looks like in this case, you actually did a PCR of lesion, you turned up uh, HSV2, and you had mm -hmm. an uh, IgG that was positive for HSV2 as well. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what would your counseling to the patient consist of as far as sort of what this means and the implications for her pregnancy? Uh, I'm sure. assuming this is a new diagnosis, but clearly by the IgG, it's been around for a while. Exactly. So give it, per the patient's history, she had had these symptoms multiple times in the past. Uh, most notably, they tended to occur during periods of stress, such as um, following um, some sort of like infection, like an upper respiratory um, infection. Yeah. So based off her history, I did not think this was consistent with a primary infection, but rather um, a recurrent infection. So I counseled her on the need to um, undergo treatment for this current um, outbreak as well as continue suppression for the remainder of her pregnancy. Um, I counseled her that because this was suspected recurrent infection, the risk of neonatal transmission was a lot significantly lower, um, approximately 3% versus a primary infection. Um, I also counseled her that when she uh, presented for uh, delivery, we would have to do um, a very detailed examination because if there are any signs of any uh, current outbreak or prodromal symptoms in a cesarean section would be indicated in order to avoid neonatal transmission. Mm -hmm. So how so how would you treat her at this point? So in my practice, I use Valtre, a valacyclovir. Um, I think that uh, it's generally easier for patients to take uh, fewer doses. So sure. for her, because her history was consistent with our current um, infection, I started her on a uh, valacyclovir 500 milligrams twice a day, which is uh, if I were just treating one episode, it would be for three days, but considering that uh, I would be treating and then moving towards suppression, the dose was functionally the same, so I just continued her on um, the uh, 500 milligrams uh, twice a day until delivery. Hmm, okay, and specific, at delivery specifically, what would you be looking for uh, just to determine whether it was safe for her to have a vaginal delivery? Exactly, so when I uh, do my exam, I look for any uh, vesicles, any um, ulcers, any signs of any uh, lesions. I would also look for any uh, sort of uh, focalized areas of erythema or edema because that could be consistent with um, a developing outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, and anything else that you wanted to 
assess on this interview? Um, I would also, <clears throat> so the time of my delivery, I would, uh, or sorry, the time of my evaluation, I would do both an evaluation of her external genitalia as well as internally to look at the vagina and cervix. I would also evaluate the surrounding areas, such as her buttocks or her thighs, because um, if she had had a lesion in those areas, a vaginal delivery would not be contraindicated, but she would need an occlusive dressing. Good, great. If her diagnosis had been HSV-1 instead of HSV-2, would you have counseled her any differently or would your management for the rest of the pregnancy be any different? Um, if this was a general infection with HSV-1, I would, count, I would manage her the same mm -hmm. way. Same way. Good. Okay. Um, so your your treatment would be the same. Um, is there any difference between HSV one and HSV two, and sort as far as just uh, sort of clinical implications for for how these how these viruses behave? Right. So um, generally, in the past, uh, HSV one typically was more frequently associated with oral lesions, and HSV two was traditionally sure. uh, genital lesions. But now. Um, more than I think approximately half or more than half of new yeah. uh, general outbreaks are HSV1. That's true. Um, so I counsel patients on that. Um, if occasionally if a patient had had serologies done for whatever indication and no history of any sort of outbreaks either orally yeah. or genitally, if it was HSV1, I typically counsel patients. We don't really know if it's genital or oral. Um, mm -hmm. And I typically would manage patients as if they hypothetically were uh, positive, uh, generally positive. And in terms of the um, risk of recur or recurrent outbreaks, to my understanding, HSV-1 has uh, less frequent uh, outbreaks and less frequent uh, asymptomatic viral shedding than HSV-2. Uh, so I also uh, would keep that in mind, but I would still manage the patients the same way. Hmm. So you say HSV-1 has less asymptomatic shedding than HSV-2? I believe so, but I would have to double check that. It's it's actually it's actually the issue with HSV one is that there's actually more. Ah, yeah. So then and that would bring up the question. So if you knew she has HSV one and there's more asymptomatic shedding and her she's going to deliver in the next three weeks, um, would that in any way change your concerns as far as potential mode of delivery? So I would still uh, if if this were a recurrent outbreak and the patient. Um, either yeah. type of HSV, if the lesions were absolutely completely healed and there was no concern for any symptoms at the time of delivery, I would allow her or I would allow her to continue with labor, but I would engage in a shared decision-making process counseled on the risk of asymptomatic uh, viral shedding, uh, the yeah. implications in neonatal HSV uh, infection, and um, <laughs> through that shared decision-making process, I would counsel on both the risk and benefits of labor versus a uh, primary steroid section. Okay. And I would offer it, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Okay. Based on your management of the patient, is there anything about that that might um, sort of reassure you as far as the potential for an vaginal delivery, given how you've described your evaluation and management so far, if she had HSV-1? Um, so for this patient, this was a recurrent outbreak. She um, was on, on me uh, medication until the time of delivery. She was compliant exactly. with... She was in suppressive therapy. That's the answer. Yeah. So suppressive therapy is, is reasonably effective at su suppressing this asymptomatic shedding. So the important thing to mention the examiner is you did tell him back at the beginning that you put her on the valacyclovir and you're continuing that straight through delivery. So despite the fact that HSV-1 is more problematic that way, you're doing your very best to suppress it. And that should be fairly effective. Right. Yeah. So so with that, I mean, that's the management that allows you to maximize the chance of a vaginal delivery. And that's I think that's pretty much all you have to say. Thank you. Good, good deal. Thank you for doing that with us. Just a second here and let's drop back up. I'm just gonna see if we catch Dr. Dykes for a moment and then see maybe one more candidate. Hang on just a moment. Let's slow this evening. Uh, Bethany, you're gonna try again and see if I can get you unmuted. Can you hear me? Oh, there, oh, good, you're back. Yes, hi, Oh, Thanks. excellent, thank you Thanks so much. Us. Good, all right, let me run down to your case list here, which I did see on the way through here. I think. Hang on just a second. Oh, it's up, it's under Dykes. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. I walked right by it, I'm I sure. Think, yes. Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back down. All right, what am I missing here? Oh, there I am. Sorry, it was sitting right in front of me. Never mind. All right, good. Got you ready to go. OBGYN or office? Uh, your preference. Uh, GYN, please. Um, if GYN. you don't mind, case 29 in particular. 29, you bet. Coming right to it. Yep. 
There we go. All right, let's put it up here so everybody can see it. Operator management of pelvic pain. All right, so 46-year-old chronic pelvic pain, metallic clip in the posterior cul-de-sac, two centimeters, and the ovarian cyst, and prior uh, filsy cups. Great. So let's see. Removal of misplaced filsy cup. Okay, great. So what should we talk about about this particular case? This is rather interesting. Um I think particularly the use of the robotics with this case um, and yeah. justifying that. Sure. So why don't you tell us about that? Why? Uh, so first of all, let's get to indication for surgery here. So she had chronic pelvic pain and she had a simple right ovarian cyst and she'd had an endometrial ablation. Um, can you, what did you link the chronic pelvic pain to as far as sort of where it was and what it was? What did you associate the pain with that yes. led you to operate upon her? So t two main reasons for my concern for her chronic pelvic pain is number one, she had been seen by several other specialists, including urology and GI and had thorough yeah. workups, including Good. ruling out interstitial cystitis and even a colostomy to rule out colitis or other colon yeah. causes to be causing her pain. Um, and the only previous abdominal surgery she had had was the BTL with filchy clips. Um, yeah. But I did review that previous operative report. And strangely enough, it did report um, lots of pelvic adhesions um, uh, and when uh -huh. that per surgery was performed. Um, uh -huh. So between that and the misplaced filchy clip, Mm. Um, she did also report dyspareunia, um, and the filchy clip just so happened to be located in the posterior cul-de-sac. Uh, so I between see. the lesions and the filchy clip in the posterior cul-de-sac, I was concerned that she may have quite a bit of adhesions, which she did uh, end up having. Um, uh, and I thought that the increased visualization and wristed instruments would better help me to um, best perform her surgery. Good. I think as an examiner, I would accept pretty much everything that you just said there. I think that was nicely done. And the key thing with these pelvic pain cases, which you did, is we really want to link the pain to something that we find as far as location. And you did that nicely with the dyspareunia. Um, they're ruling out other compartmental issues for you know abdominal pelvic pain and that it's more likely gynecologic. And the issue, very nicely, you went back and reviewed the um, the tubal report and there's a license of adhesions. The question will come up is um, how, how does license of adhesions help us in managing chronic pelvic pain? Um, so there has been reports that um, having adhesions in the pelvic cavity and in the abdominal pain can cause uh, pain for patients. And when those yes. adhesions are completely removed um, from both attachments, that a patient can report relief after surgery. There is certainly a risk that the adhesions could reoccur, um, exactly. but patients do report relief at least for some time following surgery. Sounds good. How would you counsel this patient about her issue of her tubal sterilization? Um, is that still reliable? Yes. So uh, the she, uh, I did counsel the patient following the surgery regarding this. Um, I took a survey of her pelvis and the filchy clip that had fallen off. Um, it was no longer present on that tube, but I did inspect the tube and it was completely transected and separated. Perfect. Um, exactly. So I didn't feel that any further contraception was indicated. I looked at the contralateral side as well, and the filchy clip was uh, fully intact on that side. Perfect, and that and that's exactly right. And this is actually well known with filchy clips in the in the decades since they've been developed, is that this can happen when you put the clip on. It actually does sort of crush and devascularize that part of the uh, tube, and over time, that tissue can actually just sort of sort of uh, just dissipate uh, from being devascularized and become sort of membranous. Uh, and at some point, it actually just can disappear, and the clip can actually fall off. But what you have there is that that devascularized portion of the tube is actually a complete transection, and the ends of the tube are separated. Uh, and it is, in fact, an effective tubal sterilization. And these clips are found all over the peritoneal cavity uh, in people who have had filthy clip tubals. Uh, and the clip you know, may or may not need to be removed. It doesn't necessarily if it's just somewhere where it's not really causing symptoms or pain. Uh, but the, the tubal ligation should be, should be adequate. Um, and, and the clip has done its job. That's absolutely right. Good. Uh, let's see. So life adhesions, removal of misplaced clip, right ovarian cystectomy. Uh, and it looks like your pathology was otherwise completely normal. Um, is there anything else that we should think of as, as far as sort of ongoing care for this case or, or anything else that you were wondering if an examiner might ask you? Um, no, I think my main concern was um, I was worried about justifying the use of the robot because I know yeah. in my mind, I felt like it was justified, but I know um, 
you know, robotics has not been proven to be superior sure. to straight stick laparoscopy. And there's a lot of um, arguments against uh, overuse of the robot. And I certainly have quite a bit of that on my case list. So that was my True. concern. True. So for, for you, each of those cases will involve sort of coming up with a reason why robots were helpful for you, because you have a robotic assisted hysterectomy sort of right underneath that. Yes. Um, and things like that. But if we're talking about just this case, I think you described it, you were concerned about really significant adhesions. Uh, you do want to really adhesion your lysis, the, the more meticulously it's done, the, the less adhesions are likely to form to a, to a degree that they're going to cause recurrent symptoms. They will over time. Uh, but that is one way in which potentially robotic surgery can actually be an advantage over open or straight stick laparoscopy. Uh, when you're really trying to do a good job with dense adhesions and be careful with the tissues and minimize sort of tissue manipulation and, and trauma uh, and inflammation so that adhesions would reform and you might possibly um, have a better result uh, and if you feel it will give you a better procedure I, I think they would absolutely accept that okay very uh, good. And, and, and these and these clips are often difficult to find also just to have robotics are sometimes easier for working in three dimensions when you have a very small object that you're trying to fish out of the pelvis as well Perfect. Thank you so much. Good. No, I think we would accept that. Thank you. Thanks for doing that with us. We have to stop in just a moment. I think there was a question or two. I didn't want to zip down to the bottom. Uh, Dr. Martinez for just a moment. Uh, Jamara, uh, Dr. Martinez, trying to get you unmuted here. I think you had a question mark here. Did you have a question for us? Yeah, I just wanted to see if you could repeat what you said about EMB versus DNC. Um, I think it was about sampling the cavity or like the uh, percent. Yeah. Yeah. A diagnostic thing. yeah, as far as we can tell, and this actually I think is best stated in the practice bulletin on endometrial cancer, which is now several years old, but they actually, without stating it, they went back and revised it a little bit. And it's still the same practice bulletin, but they pulled some stuff out and put some stuff in. And the most recent iteration of that seems to be that sampling the cavity in the office with the, uh, they used to say a Novak curette was the best to do, but Pipel sampling is actually considered appropriate. A good recurrent pipel sampling seems to be roughly equivalent to a DNC as far as adequacy of sampling the cavity. Uh, and they used to say that each one's about 60% or so. I think with the improvement of what we understand about the techniques and our pipels and instruments are better. I think if you said 80%, you'd be reasonable on that, but they are probably about equivalent. Um, so in the case we were discussing with Dr. Harani, the issue was sort of, uh, you know, we he did an alpha sampling, he pulled out a polyp. So with a structural lesion, you might want to go and see if you could actually remove the whole polyp because a pipel sample won't take out the polyp. And that was perfectly reasonable. If, you, if he had had a, a, a normal ultrasound, uh, recurrent bleeding, and a benign endometrial sampling, there wouldn't have been a specific indication to going on to hysteroscopy and DNC um, unless the patient had Otherwise, you know, recurrent bleeding uh, and you really wanted to evaluate for a structural lesion that your ultrasound might have missed, that would be a perfectly reasonable indication there. Uh, but if the sampling were negative, it would be appropriate to continue to, to observe the patient because they are probably roughly equivalent. Okay, thank you. That Great, and thank you. Yes, go ahead. So sorry, uh, and you had said that HSV1 has more asymptomatic shedding. I think yes, I it just- should be. it should be more than two. It should be. I uh, see, I, I guess I just always, learned or I thought it was less frequent than two just because oh. I HSV2 always has like more, more like I guess symptomatic outbreaks so it I think it also is more symptomatic it's the um, the CDC 2021 uh, STD guidelines which actually came out in May actually sort of went back all through the HSV and I was reading through that and back in 2009 when they first did it they made the point that one of the reasons where 60 to 65 percent of all general HSV is now type one rather than two is that it is easier to transmit because there is this asymptomatic shedding you don't sort of have the warning of a prodrome or an outbreak to avoid sexual contact and that it seems to be why it's increasing over time and I believe that was reiterated in the CDC guidelines. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, no, my pleasure. Thank you. So I think, well, we do actually have to stop. That hour went fast. Boy, thank you all again for uh, participating with us. Uh, and we have one more uh, tomorrow uh, session for our structured cases. And then our uh, candidates, some of them will be starting in next week, taking the exam. Very, very best success to all of our November candidates. Uh, and we will have a webinar on Sunday evening as well as, uh, as our usual uh, pre-exam course. Uh, we will look forward to being together with you next week. I do remember that these are archived. You can go back and review them now and before your exam at any time as podcast. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us this evening and we will uh, close down for the evening. Thanks, have a great rest of the evening.